My name is Jen Lemberger and I am a programming librarian here at the Central Library and I get to work with the League of Women Voters on these civic forums that we have, so thank you for being here. Um, if you did not know already, we do have a civics at the library email list, so if you are interested in events such as our upcoming volunteer fair, our social justice book club, or author events at the library such as hosting Adi Barkin and Colson Whitehead, there is an email list sign up in the back and we encourage you to join that. Um, as well, you'll see on your seats there are recommended reading lists that are specifically related to this event and we hope that you use those to further find information, education, and motivation after today's event. Um, we are so pleased to work with the League of, of Women Voters on these civic forums and particularly on topics that we'll be talking about today where we acknowledge missteps, um, outright wrong decisions, and misheld racist beliefs, and use these to learn and be better in all of our work moving forward. Um, so we thank you all for being here, for being here to listen, to being here to learn, um, and to change ourselves and to move forward with work that needs to be done. And with that, I would like to introduce the League of Women Voters Santa Barbara President, Vijaya Jamalamadaka, to tell us more about today. Good afternoon, everybody. Thank you so much for being here. We have an exciting, exciting forum coming up. Um, thank you to Jen Lemberger and the Santa Barbara Public Library for co-sponsoring this forum with us. Um, and welcome. We are 100 years old, and that's we are celebrating, yeah. So I have a few league announcements and thank yous, and then we will get started. Um, so today, uh, the special program is during Black History Month, and the topic is the untold story of women of color in the League of Women Voters, and we have an expert and a wonderful uh, author of, of the book by the same name here um, to be our um, special speaker. And we also have our current National League president, and uh, that's uh, Ms. Chris Carson, and uh, Dr. Carolyn Jefferson Jenkins is our main speaker. Our next community forum at this library will be on the evening, evening of April 15th. The topic in honor of Earth Day in April is our climate emergency and how we can take action now. And that promises to be a really interesting forum. Um, you may think you know everything you know about climate change, but we are going to learn something a lot new, a lot more new things. So uh, please read our email updates and check our website calendar for details on all of the events. So now I'd like to thank Gary Atkins Sound Systems and Sylvia Uribe for translation. Sylvia will be doing simultaneous translation, so if you need uh, a Spanish translation, just come and sit next to her. Um, and um, thank you to TV Santa Barbara and the, and the crew, JP Montalvo, who is in charge of this product, production, will live stream this event via Facebook. It's going on right now. So there are a lot of more people who are not here watching us on Facebook. Now, both English and Spanish versions of this video will be available on the League's website, uh, our YouTube site. And so check also TVSB's website for their schedule to see when this video will be aired on channel 17 and 71. Lastly, a special thank you to Suzanne Brathen and Zandra Cholmondeley for all our league and all our league volunteers for having worked hard to put together an equality at the end of this forum. And so you are all cordially invited to join us for tea. We will have birthday cake and finger sandwiches. I will now introduce our moderator, Beth Pitten August, without whom this forum would not have been possible. Ms. Pitten August joined the League of Women Voters of Santa Barbara in 2005. After joining, she attended a monthly discussion group 
regularly. And as per league tradition, Beth was quickly recruited to the board. <laughs> so that's what happens when you join these discussion groups. <laughs> she has served as board secretary, social policy co-chair, co-president, liaison to the Santa Barbara Pro-Choice Coalition, and including as chair of the Pro-Choice uh, Coalition, and briefly served on the California League State Board. And Beth has earned a BA in International Studies from Moody Bible Institute, and an MA in uh, Liberal Studies from DePaul University. Her master's thesis explored the influence of second wave of feminism on contemporary women artists. With 20 years of experience as a nonprofit professional, she currently works as Director of Development at the University of California's Santa Barbara um, Bren School of Environmental Science and Management. A project, an important project that Beth has undertaken in her free time is a documentary film. It's called Just the Beginning, A Century of Women's Political Power. This was born out of her passion for women's rights and storytelling and her admiration for fellow League members who have dedicated themselves to years of making democracy work for everyone. She founded the production company Intersections TV to create this film. With this documentary, Beth aims to inspire women and men to use their power, vote, get involved, and make a difference on issues they care about. So we are now lucky. We will see this latest trailer. It's a two-minute clip from the film. And then Beth will take over as our forum moderator. Thank you. Thank you, thank you Vijaya, and welcome, everyone. So we'll start with just a little promo clip. Organizations have come and gone. We started out basically the same, working for voting rights, human rights. We're still here and needed as never before. Voting as a right and a fight. At the Women's March of 2017, the day after the inauguration, millions of women and their allies across the country came together and renewed their commitment to community and democracy. It's important for me to talk about the passion and the sense of purpose and the perseverance of these women of color who have always made contributions but who have not gotten the credit that they deserve. You know, I think representation matters and it's really important to have people that not only look like you but understand the issues from the community, represent you at the state capitol. At the 2018 midterm election, nearly 100 years after winning the right to vote with the passage of the 19th Amendment, record numbers of women ran and won public office. I think one of the biggest issues with government is that both the right and the left speak in absolute truths. There's no middle ground, I feel. We are nonpartisan, which is, we define, we don't support or oppose political parties or candidates for office. We speak up for what we speak up for, and um, we've been doing it for almost 100 years, and we're going to go right on doing it. This is just the beginning. A feature-length documentary coming 2020. And we're uh, aiming to have it ready uh, to celebrate the ratification of the 19th Amendment later this year. So uh, at this time, it's my privilege to introduce the president of the League of Women Voters of the United States, Chris Carson. Chris Carson was elected as the 19th president of the League of Women Voters of the United States and chair of the Board of Trustees of the League of Women Voters Education Fund in June 2016. 
Ms. Carson has been a member of her local league for over 30 years, serving all of its leadership roles. In January 2005, Ms. Carson joined the Board of the League of Women Voters of California as government director. There, she was responsible for education and advocacy in the areas of redistricting, campaign finance, elections, and voting rights issues. After her board service, Ms. Carson became the League of Women Voters of California's redistricting program director, leading its redistricting reform efforts, serving as one of the drafters of California's historic redistricting reform, and spearheading LWVC's efforts to pass this ballot measure. She also worked on effective implementation of this reform, interacting with the statewide coalition, including voting rights and minority language groups. I think we all owe her a great debt of gratitude for the much more just and fair uh, redistricting maps that we have now here in California and that are spreading across the United States. So without further ado, uh, Chris, welcome. Thank you. Thank you, Beth. I'd just like to comment that implementing the redistricting reform was about five times harder than passing the ballot measure. Um, and that's what the League is known for, process. You don't do something and walk away. And the National League is engaged in a 50-state campaign now to implement redistricting. And what we're training our state leagues who have passed Redistricting and reform measures is that you thought you worked hard getting it through. Be prepared to work five times as hard to make sure that it works right. So it is my great honor to introduce our principal speaker, um, Carolyn Jefferson Jenkins, who was the 15th president of the League of Women Voters of the United States and the um, League of Women Voters Education Fund. Um, a native of Ohio, Dr. Jefferson Jenkins has been a League member since 1982. She joined the year before I did, and is, was the first woman of African American descent to head our organization, um, but she is no longer the only one who will be president of the National League. And you're going to find out who that will be very shortly. Throughout her presidency, she placed a very high priority on campaign finance reform, election reform, and health care, particularly for underrepresented populations. Much of her tenure emphasized league impact, visibility, and organizational development. Dr. Jefferson Jenkins, this is just getting my way here. International efforts include supporting democracy building efforts in Argentina, Uruguay, Brazil, the Netherlands, Israel, and eight African countries. She worked extensively with the non-governmental organizations in these countries and continues to serve on the board of the Women Ambassadors Program at Howard University in Washington, DC. She served as a commissioner with the Judicial Independence Committee of the American Bar Association. And for three terms, she was a judge for the Good Housekeeping, Good Government Award. Dr. Jenkins is a recognized authority on voting rights of African Americans and is the author of The Road to Black Suffrage and also One Man, One Vote, The History of the African American Vote in the United States. She's also contributed to numerous journals and books on election reform. The 2000 Election, her new book, which is what we're gonna be talking about here today, The Untold Story of Women of Color in the League of Women Voters, honors the contributions of women of color to the League of Women Voters. Dr. Jenkins holds a PhD in urban education from Cleveland State University, an education specialist from Kate, Kent State University, a master's of education from John Carroll University, and a BA in education political science from Western College in Ohio. She has worked in public and private school systems and higher education since 1974. A firm believer in the value of public schools, she has served in a variety of leadership positions in Ohio, Colorado, and nationally. And she moved to North Carolina in 2014 to work at the James B. Hunt Jr. Institute for Educational Leadership and Policy. A recipient of numerous awards for her volunteerism and civic engagement, Dr. Jenkins has been recognized in notable black American women, who's who among successful African Americans, and who's who in American education. Since moving to North Carolina, 
Dr. Jenkins has been active in the League of Women Voters of Orange, Durham, and Chatham. She continues to advocate for educational excellence and stronger citizen participation in the electoral process. She speaks both nationally and internationally for Women's Equality Day, Black History Month, and Women's History Month events. And just now, we learned that she will receive the Freedom Summer of 64 Award from Miami University on March 12th. Created in 2017, the award honors leaders who strive to advance civil rights and social justice in America. Dr. Jenkins. Well, good afternoon, everyone. Good afternoon. So I have a question for you to ponder while I do my thank yous and housekeeping chores. Why this story? Why now? Think about that for a minute. I'd like to thank Councilman Friedman for taking time to share with us this afternoon. I also would like to thank Chris for that interesting introduction. <laughs> and Beth for at least asking me to come and join you this afternoon, so thank you, Beth. Uh, Jen and the library for having us here. And Santa Barbara president, I'm not even going to attempt to try her name, but Vijaya, whatever your last name is, thank you <laughs> for having me. It is um, actually fortuitous that the anniversary, 100th anniversary of the League of Women Voters occurs during Black History Month because there were hundreds of women of color who made contributions to the League of Women Voters who have yet to be recognized. And that's one of the things that I wanna do here this afternoon. I wanna introduce you to women that you may not have heard of and the contributions that they've made. I also want to use this celebration as an opportunity for discovery. And so I will be taking you on a journey throughout this 35 minutes. And afterwards, we're gonna have some time for conversation and question and answer. So let's go back to the question I ask you. Why this story and why now? And the answer is because it's time. It's time that we celebrate the contributions of all the women who through their passion, their purpose, and their perseverance shaped the League of Women Voters. The power in our story comes from remembering everything. It comes from making sure that we use this perfect time to tell our story accurately. And I liken it to taking a selfie. So if I asked you all to take out your iPhones and take a selfie, what would you do? You'd make sure you had the right angle, the lighting was right, your hair was right, everything was right because you want to present yourself in the best light that you can. And there's nothing wrong with that. The problem is that when you don't talk about hard choices that were made, when you don't look at yourself realistically, then you don't have the opportunity to adjust and to make the changes that are necessary. So I wanna thank all of you who are in this room right now. You are the ones who carry the League message on a daily basis. You are the ones who will continue to do so as you shape the League's future. Remember that knowledge is power. So in sharing with you this afternoon, I wanna do three things. I want to challenge those of you who are commemorating the League's 100th anniversary to do so in truth, recognizing that to do otherwise does not represent a comprehensive history. I want to inspire the State League and those local leagues to do their own research, recognizing the importance of an integrated history in this era of intolerance. I want to move the conversation of the contributions of women of color from the footnotes to the mainstream narrative of the League's history. And before I begin my prepared remarks, I just wanna share something with you. Writing this history was cathartic for me. It reminded me of growing up in elementary, middle, and high school. I never once saw anybody of color in any of my textbooks. The message that that sent 
was that we didn't do anything. We weren't important. One of the things that we are doing as a league is using this iconic photo. And there's nothing wrong with the photo if you tell the whole story. So there is a story that is being told by this photo, but my question is, what is the story that's not being told? The story that's not being told is that black members were relegated to the back of the parade. The story that's being told is that the national leadership of the National Association, national Association of Women made a, consider, a conscious, intentional effort to not include black women at all. And so for any of you who are in the audience who know of Delta Sigma Theta sorority, the Deltas were the ones marching at the back of the parade. So I want you to think carefully about how we celebrate. Let me share a quote with you from Carrie Chapman Catt. She said, if we learn from, ex from the experience, there is no failure, only delayed victory. And when I use this quote, I always say this was one of her more profound quotes, because those of you who know the history of Carrie Chapman Catt know that she was a walking contradiction. Not only did she make racist comments, but she also had moments of clarity that live on to this day. That contradictory philosophy carried over into what became the League of Women Voters. And so for the last 100 years, the League has struggled with its relationship with its members of color, and it has struggled on issues of race. Now is the perfect opportunity for us to do better. So while this photo tells a powerful story and we use it to represent us, when we look at the stories that aren't being told, we need to make sure that those stories are included. So I always say, go ahead and use this photo, but surround it with photos of other women of color. You don't have to use one photo to represent everything. You can use multiple photos, it won't hurt. The New York Times wrote an editorial in July of 2008 that was entitled The Racism Behind the Women's Suffrage Movement. I was not surprised when I saw the editorial, but I was pleasantly surprised that Chris Carson and Virginia Case, who is our CEO, wrote a response on behalf of the, the, the League. They both acknowledged our shortcomings and made a commitment for us to do better. So let's give Chris a round of applause. The editorial said the following. Its worst offenses may be that the movement rendered nearly invisible the black women who labored in the suffragist vineyard and that it looked away from the racism that tightened the grip on the fights for the women's vote in the years after the Civil War. And selling out the interest of African American women when it became politically expedient to do so. This betrayal of trust opened a rift between black and white feminists that persist to this day. Historians are rightly warning groups involved in suffrage commemorations not to overstate the significance of the 19th Amendment. It covered the needs of middle class white women quite nicely, but it meant very little to black women in the South where most lived. Organizers need to keep that in mind as they commemorate a movement in which racism clearly played a central role. This is a photo of Ida B. Wells Barnett. She refused to march at the back of the parade. What's interesting about this photo, it was not in the mainstream newspaper because during that time, people of color were not included in mainstream news. So this was at the Chicago Times, which was a black uh, newspaper of the time. Ida B. Wells Barnett, was a member of the Alpha Suffrage Club of Chicago, which was a unit of the League of Women Voters. She decided to integrate the delegation, even though the League leader, Grace Trout, acquiesced to the national leader's in, uh, insistence that blacks march together in the rear. Wells Barnett refused, 
and two white women, Belle Squire and Virginia Brooks, came out of the crowd and marched side by side with her in the parade. So it's interesting to note that while women of color were discouraged, there were white women who were advocating on their behalf. So to be a suffragist as a woman of color meant a series of compromises, collaboration, and controversy. If we truly believe that in history, everyone's story deserves to be told, we need to stop using the photo that I just showed you as the lone symbol of our, of our efforts. It's important to acknowledge that people of color face unique challenges in the United States and that women of color face those same challenges in the suffrage movement and subsequently in the League of Women Voters. Women of color have a special place in women's study because of the intersectionality of gender and race. But this is not one moment in time as we celebrate. We have to make sure that we can take this moment and change it into a movement, a movement that includes all women. The League is viewed as a microcosm of the politically responsible and responsive women in American society. So how do we get from this picture to this picture? We get there by making strategic decisions, by being intentional about our language, by making sure that the efforts that we put forth are inclusive. We need to make sure that our sense of purpose and perseverance that make the League so special are included. I went into uh, this writing thinking that there wouldn't be much to write about. And that's because when I became League president in 1998, I really didn't see much about women of color in the League. But as I looked at the footnotes, there was their story. And if you recall on the first slide, one of the things I want to, and, and will continue to say, is that we are more than a footnote. We belong in the mainstream narrative of the history of this organization. The League struggled with its relationships, but the League has to make intentional efforts to address what is going on. I was told that by addressing this topic, that I would make people uncomfortable. And my response to that is, this won't be the first time that a League discussion made somebody uncomfortable. The notion of women having the right to vote made people uncomfortable, and it still does. The abolishment of slavery made people uncomfortable. School desegregation made people uncomfortable, and it still does. Being called a communist in the 1950s made people uncomfortable. Women in leadership, being bosses, made people uncomfortable, and it still does. An integrated military makes people uncomfortable, and it still does. The extension of the deadline for the passage of the ERA makes people uncomfortable, and it still <laughs> does. So surely you can add your own examples to this list. There are consequences to being comfortable. Uncomfortable conversations always are complicated, but they're necessary. This is not new. Being uncomfortable forces movement. Being OK with hard conversations moves us forward. Instead of evoking discomfort, what I hope to do is inspire you to do your own research, to appreciate the full history of the organization, and to have the hard conversations about doing better. The richness of the League is in our, in, in our local and state archives, but it's also in your basements, attics, and garages. How can we, as an organization, stand up against voter suppression, gerrymandering, gender inequality, and a host of other issues, but we won't face and fix ourselves? The 100th anniversary gives us the opportunity to recommit to addressing this challenge and determine how this is going to be different. We get here by acknowledging the challenges we have had in our relationships with people of color and bringing from the footnotes their 
contributions to the league. So if 2020 is like it is for me, it gives me a headache. <laughs> we live in interesting times, times in which, in which race and gender are still at the forefront of our conversations, in our society, and in our most sacred institutions such as the League. Although women of color have always made significant contributions, their contributions, again, are relegated to the footnotes. Will 2020 be the new year of the woman? Will the census change our conversations as we change our demographics nationally? Will the elections at all levels, local, state, and national, cause us pause? The League's anniversary, the anniversary of the 19th Amendment, and how many of you recognize this is the year of the anniversary, 150th anniversary of the 15th Amendment, which caused the split in the suffrage movement. So in 1870, black men were given the right to vote. And this is also that year of celebration. In 14 days, on March 3rd, Super Tuesday, we will make some decisions. On November 3rd, we'll make other decisions. Five days ago, we celebrated the League's birthday through our days of action. That, those days of action were just the beginning. We have not completed our mission. So let me share with you some of the people whose names you need to know that you may not. Frances Ellen Watkins Harper was an abolitionist and a suffragette. She made sure that she carried the message of suffragists. And women of color did that because that was their cause as well. One of my favorite people is Addie Hunton. She and a group of colored women proposed to League leaders in 1921 at the convention in Cleveland that the League continue to assist colored women in achieving full privileges. So the 19th Amendment, while we want to celebrate that, was not a celebration for all women. It was a celebration for white women. So Addie Hunton went to the League leadership and asked to speak before the delegation at the convention. She was told no because Southern Leagues threatened to walk out if she were allowed to speak on the convention floor. So she met with the executive committee and presented her proposal. Um, as is a good league compromise, the executive committee decided that they would create a special committee on the problem of Negroes instead of bringing it to the delegate floor. They agreed in executive session to do that and for Mrs. Hunton, she was notified by mail of the decision. So in 1921, the Special Committee on Negro Problems and the Problem of Negroes, and it's recorded differently um, throughout uh, Library of Congress documents, that committee was never funded, its activities were never advertised, and somewhere in the 1950s, it kind of just disappeared. Ida B. Wells Barnett, we've talked about. Mary Church Terrell is another interesting person. Um, she wrote a book called The Colored Woman in the White World. You know, she was a, a frequent speaker at league conventions, and even though she was a league member, she was not a seated delegate because she couldn't be. So she could speak, but then she had to leave. She was a longstanding member, never afforded full rights and privileges of other League members. And she spoke often about that. Nanny Helen Burroughs gave a speech in 1900 at the National Baptist Convention on how the sisters are hindered from helping in the suffrage movement. If you look at these ladies from the Executive Board of Rhode Island, what these photos show is that the organizational leadership skills that the League valued so much was also present in women of color, yet they were not given the privilege of being League members. This is just a photo of women who in the 1920s were advocating for uh, 
women's rights to vote. Other names that you should know, Anna Julia Cooper, Hetty Tilgman. This is the headquarters of the Colored Women's League, and it was based in Georgia. This photo challenges us to stop looking at the differences and look at the similarities. A group of women with a cause who want progress. We could easily substitute white women for these colored women in the picture and have a very different conversation. The separate clubs became necessary as black women began experiencing what was called anti-black suffrage movement. Reportedly, the National Women's Suffrage Association considered the Northern Federation of Colored Women's Clubs to be a liability to the association due to Southern white women's attitudes toward black women getting the vote. And Southern white women took a lot of the blame when in fact there were Northern white women who were just as opposed to having black women around. Fanny Jackson Cooper. Now let's talk about California. One of the reasons that I chose Central California to begin my book tour was because it is steeped in the history of the national conversation between women of color and the National League leadership. Despite being discouraged from joining the League and harsh, res harsh resistance to their participation, women of color in Los Angeles, Oakland, and San Francisco persisted in forcing League leaders to acknowledge the disconnect between their treatment and League bylaws and principles. That this conversation was taking place on the West Coast was of particular note, since it would have been expected to be occurring only in the South. The California Federation of Colored Women's Clubs was actually founded in 1906 and joined the national organization in 1908. The photo that you're looking at is from July 1915, and this was taken in Oakland, California, founded by Eliza Warren. Their motto, deeds, not words. And here's my favorite person, and this is why I spent so much time researching California. How many of you have heard of Delilah Beasley? Wow, okay, a few of you. So recently there was a New York Times article, uh, February 2020, that said the pioneer black historian who was almost erased from history. In working with the California Historical Society, and those of you who are familiar with that, you need to do some more research on Delilah Beasley. They have tons of research on women of color in California who were part of the suffrage movement and later the League of Women Voters. So Delilah Beasley was born in September of 1867 in Cincinnati, and she enrolled in history courses. She was a self-made historian. She ended up writing a book that was published called The Negro Trailblazers of California. And it's an interesting book because it talks about the families in California, the struggles that people of color had, and how they were able to succeed. In 1923, the Oakland Tribune started a new weekly column called Activities Among Negroes. And she used her voice to highlight the achievements of black Californians and to support black dignity and rights and to raise awareness about the barriers that existed for people of color and women and encourage interracial activities. She founded the Alameda County League of Women Voters. One of the things that I um, was quite interested in, and I'm going to have you engage with me in, in a short little activity before I continue on with my prepared remarks. Delilah Beasley wrote at least 16 letters in March of 1926 to the national leadership of the League of Women Voters. And those letters were, one, asking for guidance, two, telling them about her struggles in getting women of color to be accepted as league members, and three, asking for permission to start colored leagues. There is nothing in the league bylaws that advocates colored leagues, but guess what? There were three colored leagues in California. So what I wanna do is I'm going to read to you the actual letter, one of the actual letters that she sent 
to the national leadership asking for their permission. And what I'm going to do is divide you into two groups, and you're going to do a little neighbor talk. So those of you in the front half of the room will represent women of color. Those of you in the back half of the room are going to represent league leadership. And what you're going to do is listen to this letter and tell me how you would respond in 1926 and in 2020. All right, so her letters were directed to uh, Mrs. Warren Wheaton, who was the press secretary of the National League of Women Voters. Interestingly enough, when I did the research on this, there is the actual letter, and then there's an excerpt of the letter. The excerpt of the letter that went to the National League leadership leaves out the part about the struggles that she said in her original letter. So I'm going to read to you from the original letter. So there are lots of pleasantries. Um, and then she says, the state president of the California League has, through my assistance and that of my friends, finally succeeded in organizing in Los Angeles a colored unit or League of Women Voters. The president is Mrs. Charlotte Bass. She's the editor of the California Eagle. And she's a very dear friend of mine. I would love for you to write and welcome her to the League. I have had a terrible time getting this league going. You see, there is a great deal of prejudice in this state toward my race, and especially in Los Angeles. I have discovered that in cities where there are full colored leagues and not auxiliaries of colored women develop leadership, they do not antagonize the members of the white league by their presence. In this way, I hope the league will help solve the race problem. I, of course, expect the colored units to have representation on the various boards, the same as the Alameda County League, of which I am a member. But in my effort to get things started, you have no idea the heartaches and the mental agony I have passed through. But I do wish you would suggest to the president, Ms. Sherwin, that if she will recommend the organizing of all colored leagues and no auxiliaries, I believe it will move the future without trouble. It will also train Negro leadership among the colored women to that extent that scheming politicians will no longer have a chance to exploit their votes. All right. Those of you in the front are women of color. What is this all about? What decisions need to be made in 1926 to respond to Delilah Beasley, and what decisions would you make now in 2020? Those of you in the back are league leadership. How are you going to respond to this? She's raised several issues. What do you think? And this is going to be like a quick five-minute activity. You're going to talk to your neighbor and make some decisions that will move the league forward. All right, women of color, somebody speak for the front group. Women of color, what's the decision? How are you responding to Delilah Beasley? Anybody want to speak for her? What issues? Come on. Oh, I've never known league members to be totally quiet. That's in. All right, league leadership, somebody in the back. You would advocate, okay, so to open it up, but it's already, there's nothing in the bylaws that allows for colored leagues. The bylaws say leagues can exist. It doesn't say they have to be segregated. It doesn't say that they can't. All right, so the women of color are saying it doesn't say that they can't. Why was it a unit and not a league? Good question because that was the decision that was made. What, if you heard in the letter what she said is we don't want to offend people. We want to be able to advocate for our cause without having an additional fight. And so in order to do that, then I have to compromise. So the compromise was I would rather be in a unit and have access to league resources than not be at all. 
Now, keep in mind that there were a number of women of color who refused to be segregated. They just said, no, I'm not joining the League of Women Voters if this is the way it has to be. It wasn't even equal. Here's the other thing. They, it, they paid the same dues as everybody else. So the dues were $50. So they still had to get their $50 and send it to National just like everybody else. One of the reasons why I wanted to do that activity is because history is about stories and about real people. And if you can hear what real people say in real time, it makes you think differently about how you analyze what was going on. Think about that as you move through the remainder of this 100th anniversary celebration and what that means for this organization. All right, another interesting uh, tidbit. Eleanor Roosevelt, how many of you knew that she was vice president of legislative policy for the National League? Okay, three people. Okay, she, five people. She was while she was first lady, and she took a lot of heat because in 1956, she wrote a New York Times editorial criticizing the league on its hypocrisy as it related to race. And I said, good for her. You can actually, if you Google online, you can find the editorial. It is there. There was a lot of backlash, and there were letters that came from the national leadership apologizing particularly to Southern Leagues, for her comments. So the League has always had what I call a transactional relationship with women of color. And by transactional, I meant, mean that they knew that they needed them, but they really didn't want to embrace them. So Mary McLeod Bethune and Dr. Dorothy Hyde, both former presidents of the National Council of Negro Women, were always involved in the League and actually were members, but never rose to leadership ranks and never were embraced. So the relationship between the League of Women Voters and the National Council of Negro Women was one that was interdependent but transactional. And one of the things that I say in the book is, why couldn't we be transformational? Why do we have to be transactional? And that's a question that I leave with you as well. Shirley Chisholm was a league member. How many of you knew that? A little few more hands, OK. <laughs> All right, so the untold story of women of color. I told you um, when I first started, it was cathartic. One of the interesting things about this cover is a 1970 league event in Flint, Michigan. And you can tell by the words that this was the 70s, which has a, a unique um, coming of age memory for me. Uh, the book discusses the origin and the evolution of the League's attitude reflected in its policies and practices toward the inclusion of women of color into the organization. It presents an accurate and a respectful record of the strategic choices the organization made in its relationship with its members of color. I recognize that as I am analyzing and re recording this, that I'm looking at it through 21st century eyes. I realize that. And the decisions that were made were made in the moment, in, in the time. And not that I necessarily agree with them, but I understand them. And so part of the book is more hopeful. It, it's a factual book, but it's, it's more hopeful about what we can do to move forward. So the chapters, as it's organized, is not chronological. The chapters are organized ideologically. So I begin with, lest we forget. So one of the things uh, is that we were there, too. We should not forget that we were there, too. It wasn't just white women in white dresses. And that's another myth about the parade. Everybody in the parade wasn't wearing white. The, by different professions, they were color-coded by profession, and some wore academics wore their regalia. The other thing is the Negroes Hour. That talks about the, um, the, split, the split that occurred. Do black men get the right to vote first or women? And so I, I discuss that a lot. There's a delicate balance between race and gender. And then I talk about all of our achievements, but all of our setbacks. To finish the fight, the League was supposed to be an every woman's organization. It wasn't. 
It was every woman that they wanted to join. It wasn't in every woman's organization. And most of the decisions that were made were decisions between principle and practicality. And in most instances, practicality won out. So then you ask the question, why would women of color even want to be associated with this organization that didn't want them? For the sake of the cause. We all had the same cause. The League had access where colored organizations did not, because in many instances with politicians, they were dismissed. But the League was never dismissed. So for the sake of the cause, these women aligned with the League. The Lessons of the Hour is one of my favorite chapters. Did we learn anything? And if we did, how is it that 100 years later we're still having the same conversation? Through amber-colored glasses. Everybody wants to see an organization through rose-colored glasses. I see it through the lens of race. Amber-colored glasses is the lens of race. So there are two realities. But there's always hope. And there are always turning points. You will enjoy the League way, because you've all heard that phrase before. The weight of history talks about my presidency as being the first and in the first 100 years, the only person of color. So there's nobody whose, whose footsteps I walked in at that level. And th there was a certain responsibility that came with that, often imposed from outside. And I often tell the story that when I would go to speak, I was league president because I labored in the trenches at the local, state, and national levels. I had done everything you could do in the league to become president. But the only question people wanted to ask me was, how does it feel to be the first African American? So I said, I thought I was league president because I've earned it. And what I've learned is that I'm black. <laughs> so I finally, um, in the final chapter, moving forward, is the unfinished fight. Some things that are of interest, I, in the book, there's also a list of every board member of color who has served. And out of 580 board members who have served, 18 were black. Um, also, in 1970, there was a black caucus of 23 women who decided at the league convention that they wanted to get together because they had, they had to push an agenda to league leadership where they would be heard. And I also list their names. So as you look through the names of the people there, a lot of them I could not associate with states or cities, but their names you'll recognize if you see them. So here we go. I thought that it would be a good idea to see how much you really know about the League and Women of Color. And as I was doing it, I put League Trivia, and I said, no. By trivia, I am further marginalizing the contributions. And I did that unconsciously. And I'm like, that does not make any sense. These are League facts. So the first one you know the answer to. Who's the only person of color to serve as the League of Women Voters of the United States President? That would be me. <laughs> At which convention was the Special Committee on the Study of Negro Problems established? 1921. In what year was the Special Committee disbanded? Just disappeared. It never was officially disbanded. It just disappeared. When was the first New York Times editorial about the League and issues of race published? 1946. Uh, Mrs. Maxwell Barris, president of the New Jersey League, presented a resolution under which only those hotels um, which would accept, which accepted all delegates without discrimination as to race would hereafter have the pat patronage of the League Biennial co Convention. The motion was carried by voice vote, and at this convention there At which convention did delegates adopt a policy to not schedule league meetings at hotels that discriminated? 1956. 
which state league lodged a formal complaint with National League about the treatment of its members by hotels in the area, even though the policy was in place? Virginia. That was also in 1956. The Hampton, Virginia League sent a letter uh, indicating that the hotel would not allow its members. Which first lady and former LWV US Legislative Policy VP wrote an editorial about league hypocrisy on issues of race? Eleanor Roosevelt. In what year did LWV US bylaws allow for the establishment of colored leagues? Never. It never prohibited it either, but it never. Which six cities were reported to have fully functioning colored leagues? Oakland, San Francisco, Los Angeles, Chicago, St. Louis, and my favorite, Tacoma, Washington. <laughs> and I actually did a little more research to find out why Tacoma had a colored league. Because of the shipyards, there was aggressive recruiting in the South to get blacks to move to Tacoma. So there was a critical mass of black people in Tacoma. Which two Ohio cities requested permission to have colored leagues? Toledo and Cincinnati. And that was in 1928. What state had Indian leagues? Wisconsin. After, yeah, after idiots became citizens, they formed two Indian leagues. Which southern state did not participate in meetings of southern league presidents because they had no problem with race and membership? Kentucky. In, in the 1953 publication, How to Get and Keep Members, what excuses were given for why women of color were not or could not be members of the League of Women Voters? They are uneducated. They are domestic and skilled workers. They had to be taught. The League attracted women as members who were well-educated, middle-class, and progressive in their thoughts, and they were not. Which state and local League rejected the mother of a major city mayor for membership? Louisiana. Sybil Morial wrote a memoir about how she wanted to join the League, and she specifically said the League of Women Voters would not accept her as a member. When was the first self-study in which the League was described as being an organization of educated middle to upper class, middle-aged white women? When was that first study done? 1929. When was the last study done that said the same thing? 2018. Who was the first black national board member? Dr. Josie Johnson from Minnesota. And she was appointed to the board in 1968 after the insistence of Barbara Stuhler, who many of you uh, may know. When did the black caucus start to convene on a formal basis at conventions? 1970. Which state is home to the local league that has designed an initiative entitled Forgotten Foremothers. Indiana, the League of Women Voters of Muncie, Delaware, has started this initiative. OK, for those of you who are social media aficionados, how do we change the narrative of our memory? And I've pulled some hashtags out for you to consider. The first one, we were there too. Second, rhetoric or reality? Are we just going to talk about it or are we actually going to do something? Strategic choices. Everything that we do is a choice. It's a choice to have something. It's a choice not to have it. A sense of hope. There is always a sense of hope. Doing the right thing. A fragile balance. A new day. Believe. The promise of a new order. I, too, am the League. We've been here before. Finding purpose and hope, promise, and possibilities. 
So our story as we celebrate the 100th anniversary and the story of women of color is important to us. So as we celebrate the 100th anniversary, the story that we have chosen to tell to this point has marginalized the contributions of women of color in the league's achievements, in its images, in its symbols and messaging. So what? To discount or relegate to the footnotes of history the significant contributions of these women is contradictory to the league's mission, vision, and principles. Now what? Use the 100th anniversary recognition activities and events as an opportunity to represent the league in all of its dimensions, the good, the bad, the ugly, and to use the lessons learned to chart a path for the organization to do better in the future. The League of Women Voters is more than the sum of its parts. Celebrating the accomplishments of all members and supporters and recounting the League's history is important. Embracing the hard and awful and often painful aspects of the organization as it struggles with its relationships with members of color provides a more comprehensive accounting. Every story, every woman of color discussed in this book is exceptional and, represent, and representative of the hundreds of women who over the past 100 years have contributed to the League's enduring legacy at the local, state, and national level. The failure of historians to acknowledge the contributions that people of color made in society shaped my perception for years. I recognize that whatever I accomplished in the League of Women Voters was because of the efforts of those women who came before me both black and white, who challenged the League to be true to its principles. Every story has a hero, and in the League story, Carrie Chapman Catt is the hero. In my story, my grandmother is my hero. And she had four things that she called her cycle of life. And I want to just tell you the story, her story, which morphs into my story and why it's important that we remember everybody's story. So my grandmother believed in hope, promise, commitment, and possibilities. And in those four areas, there is a cycle of life. So my grandmother's generation was a generation of hope. She was the first generation out of slavery. She was born in 1903. In 1920, she graduated from normal school and became a teacher. She would pick cotton in the morning, teach school, and then in the evenings, teach her neighbors and friends how to write their names so that they could register to vote. When women got the right to vote in 1920, she knew it didn't affect her. She couldn't vote as a first-class citizen until she was 62 years old. Not because she wasn't an upstanding citizen, but because the Voting Rights Act was not passed until 1965. I still have her poll tax receipt, and it serves to motivate me. I often ask people, what would $72 do for you? And $72 is an interesting figure because the poll tax itself was $1, but you had to pay your property tax before you could pay your poll tax. And for many people, that was cumbersome. So that was the generation of hope. My parents' generation was a generation of promise. Both my mother and father moved north um, during the Great Migration to find jobs in the factories and escape the, the discrimination of the Deep South. Despite their limited education, they knew that education was the great leveler in this society, and they instilled in their children the need to have a choice. They did not allow us to get caught up in the noise that said, Women can't do things, blacks can't do things, society doesn't let you, whites only, coloreds only, doesn't make any difference. Theirs was a generation of promise. My generation, the boomers, we're the generation who benefited from the first two generations, and ours was a commitment. We were able to, to attend college, to live wherever we wanted. We came of age during the most significant social changes of history, currently being challenged. We never saw black women in significant numbers in textbooks, and I never did until I got to college. 
what I thought were the three biggest things to change the world, the remote control, the garage door opener, and the mouse, are now obsolete. Civil rights, human rights, women's rights, sex, drugs, and rock and roll. That was the generation of commitment. And then there was a generation for my nieces and nephews and her great-grandchildren, the Gen Xs and the Millennials, the generation who has never known that television actually signed off at midnight, <laughs> that suitcases did not have rollers, that there were only 48 states when I started school, that landlines and one phone were the norm in most households. And I wrote before recently, I said, and never seen a US president impeached, I need to change that. Didn't know what it's like to see a library catalog. They haven't seen commercials without diversity. They see women as sportscasters, women as leads in movies, directors, CEOs, governors, and legislators. They routinely use Facebook and other social media they, you, they are accustomed to cars that drive themselves, global warming, women CEOs, a black president, and that's the generation of possibilities. What do all of these stories have in common? Different decades, different challenges, but people visioning and believing in this great democracy, a strong belief in hope, promise, commitment, and possibilities. So here's my grandmother teaching at the normal school in 1920. Remember hers was a generation of hope. This is her poll tax receipt. What is interesting, if you've never seen one, what's interesting is the Voting Rights Act was passed in August of 65. This is dated October of 65. So anytime legislation is passed, implementation does not take place immediately. Her granddaughter, first woman of color to be president of the League of Women Voters. That was the generation of commitment. And finally, her great-grandson is a Senate page holding the door. <laughs> so 100 years of hope, promise, commitment, and possibilities. So let me, let me conclude by giving you a call to action. There is power in our story, but only if we acknowledge our past and use the lessons learned to improve our future. The League's story is a story of resistance, resilience, and renewal. It is a story that includes the contributions of all of its members. As the League has evolved, it still does not represent the demographics of the nation in which we live. As a result, the good work that is done and the impact it can have is not being fully realized. The contradictions and paradoxes of an every woman's organization that did not address in any effective, sustainable way its most critical issue of inclusion of all women, whether ideological or organizational, cannot stand. We are the architects of our own narrative as individuals and as an organization. We must proclaim the importance of history and use it as a blueprint for the future. Through passion, a sense of purpose, and perseverance, women of color change the history of the League. My determination to honor the legacy of these women is a weight I am willing to bear. This is personal to me. The League of Women Voters marginalized the contributions of women of color in its first 100 years, telling their story now forces the organization to take a candid look at itself and change. We cannot forget what happened. We must remember who we are and who we aspire to be. Everything that makes the League the League, its principles, its beliefs, its members, is what we know will continue to make us relevant for the remainder of the 21st century and well into the next 100 years. This is our chance to get it right. To be the first was an honor. To be the only, a disappointment and a missed opportunity. When the League is at its best, as it has been in advocacy and education, it is a powerful force to be reckoned with. When it is anything less 
as it has been in its relationship with its members of color, it is less. We must have a vision of better things, of a united, inclusive league, an agenda to help make it happen. An opportunity like this occurs every 100 years. What we decide to do here today will forever and fundamentally alter the core of this grassroots membership organization. At a time when our nation is being challenged on so many fronts, there, this is not the time for the League to go backwards. The contributions of everyone's lives deserves more than a footnote. I am more than a footnote. You are more than a footnote. We collectively are more than a footnote. The nation is just engaged in a monumental stress test for our Constitution. And we're facing another in the elections of 2020, both the primaries in, on March 3rd and the elections on November 3rd. We need all of the power that we have to make this democracy work, to keep it strong. Let's pivot toward a productive future, toward a future of access and inclusion. My dream for this organization that has such promise is that in the next 100 years, it will recognize the value of all people in reality, not just rhetoric, in value, not just voice, in beliefs, not just benefits, no quotas, no stereotypes, no labels, no double standards, without the residue of race. An organization that is true to its principles and its ideals. The League of Women Voters, my organization of choice, is positioned for change. The future is about change. It's about building on the successes of the past and welcoming the opportunities of the future. We are entrusted with the legacy of the suffrage movement, and we are challenged to finish the fight. Let's do just that. Let's celebrate by acknowledging our past as a prelude to the future, by telling the truth and using the lessons learned to do better, by moving forward, by imagining the unimaginable, by voting, by reclaiming the power in our story, by telling the untold story of women of color in the League of Women Voters. The celebration can best be summarized in a quote by Carrie Chapman Catt. And as I said before, she's a walking contradiction. But she did have a saying about a vision of better things. There are men and women with a vision of better things, and men and women with no vision. The League of Women Voters makes its call to the brave, the intelligent, the forward-looking. No other will be interested. At this equality on February 19th, 2020, I am making this call to all of you. Happy birthday, League of Women Voters. Thank you. Thank you. So there is another part to this where we talk, so <laughs> we could <can> talk. <laughs> um, Chris and Beth and I are going to be available to answer your questions. Uh, but if you, while we're setting up, any questions you have about the book or my remarks? This is the quietest league group I have ever. Here's the interesting thing. It is not officially released until February 29th. But if you look on the back um, table, there are some postcards with the, where you can order the book, but there's also 20% off. But I don't even have a copy of it, which is interesting. <laughs> So I can talk about it, but I don't have a copy of it. So February 29th is the official release date, and you can pre-order it. OK. Oh, hi. Hello? Yeah. Uh, what was the reaction, by and large, of black men 
to black women wanting to get involved in the League of Women Voters? So, all of it was supportive because uh, one of the things I learned, as I said, is not only was the League transactional with women of color, but women of color were transactional with the League. So the League gave access where you normally would not have access. So any organization that would allow access that would further the agenda was supported. So there, there were, of course, differing conversations, but for the most part, the League gave access to mainstream white uh, politicians and organizations. And so if that gave you entree, that's fine. The other thing that I learned is that women of color who were members of the League also, for many of them, got appointed positions. And because they were in appointed positions or ran for elected positions, were able to bring voice to whatever the conversation was. So there was no uh, dissension that occurred between black men and black women from the research that I've done. Thank you for that question. So I was surprised to see the, the 2018 survey of the membership reflected pretty much the same as so many, 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 many years before that. And I'm wondering um, what obstacles still remain to, to change that dynamic? Well, first you have to understand um, up until about four years ago, the League of Women Voters did not believe in data collection. It's the reality. We never asked our members, who are you? Right. Um, and to be perfectly blunt about it, uh, we may have had any number of people, depending on where you were in the country, we may have had any number of members who were African American or Latinx or Middle Eastern or whoever, or Native American, um, and uh, how would we have known, and um, lots of leagues still don't like to, when we ask for demographic data, well, we don't ask people who they are. Um, there weren't many, but there were probably more than we knew, simply because we never collected the data. Well, All right, and, and so yes, and they did that demographic survey on self-reporting uh, and a hope, and based on that, they just uh, made some rough calculations because what else can you do? And so we took that as a baseline and said, first, we have got to get better at data collection, and we are, and, but we think it's probably a good picture of who we were at that time. And so um, we set out to change it. Uh, but, but I have to say that you can't go and say to people, would you like to be my token minority? Sure, <laughs> <laughs> um, so that, that was just based upon the, the little information that we had and, and a rough guess as to who we were. And we just said, OK, so here it is. So now we start to change. And every, every decade, um, there were external groups that, that did surveys of the league. So um, Michigan University of Michigan did one, one decade. It, what was Interesting was the consistency of it, and as Chris said, we didn't collect data. The only time that data was officially collected is in 1970 when the Black Caucus requested it, and again, it was self-report. But in terms of why, because we as League members tend to ask our friends to join. So if your sphere of influence does not include anyone of color, then you're not going to ask anyone of color. You're going to ask your friends and people that you're comfortable with. And so oftentimes, it is uncom uncomfortable to step out of your zone to, to try and do some outreach. But as Chris said, what do you want me to be a member for? Am I your project? And if that's the case, then I don't need to join the league, because there are other places where I can go where I'm valued. And one of the things that I found in the research is that if people don't, and, and this is true of, if people don't feel valued, they're not going to join an organization. So if we have an initiative and you need, because of the initiative, people of color, I don't want to join because of that. You've never asked me before. Why are you asking me now? And I don't want to be, I always say, I'm not the resident Negro. 
So I don't want to be that. And so we, we need to do better. And one of the things that is encouraging to me is the diversity, equity, and initiative, um, inclusion initiative because it's being funded. Things that are funded get done. Things that become a priority get done. And what needs to happen, it needs to be systemic. It needs to be a part of the system so that you don't have to think of it as an aside. It's not a project. It's not something that's going to come and go in 10 years. This is a part of who we are as an organization. Okay. Uh, I just want to follow up on um, that last comment about uh, what gets done uh, is, is what gets funded. And um, one of the things that I've found a little odd about the league, and I haven't been a member for that long, uh, is the league has a very long tradition of we're a volunteer organization. You know, we don't have paid staff, at least not at the local level. Uh, we, just, we volunteer and we do everything. And I think this comes out of a long socioeconomic, upper middle class, middle, you know, white tradition um, that may be holding us back um, because the, the, the demographic has changed and, and women are in the workplace and women are expected to work and women are carrying a big load in their families. And so I wonder if you have, from your years of experience with the league, some, some thoughts about whether we need to uh, make little progress out of that sense that, well, Yes, I give my time, but I don't give my money because we're just a volunteer organization. Well, do you mean specifically funding diversity, equity, and inclusion, or just the organization as a whole? I, I think I think it's 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 broader, um, the the organization as a whole. But I think it could be part of an impediment to to being more inclusive in in membership. Well, I, I guess, I, speaking of it, because I was president when we got this started, um, our diversity, equity, inclusion committee and the staff that is dedicated to it full time, uh, you can't just tell a whole organization of tens of thousands of people, okay, now go out and be more diverse, equitable, and inclusive. Um, there, you've got to have some kind of support and assistance, which is what we started to do, and we built it, and rolling it out and, and getting training and participation on the part of state and local leagues, and, and it's, it's building. Uh, because people need help. And um, we went out and got sought and continued to secure funding to do the best professional job possible. But at a certain point, the volunteers, the people who belong to this organization, have to interiorize that, commit to it the way you commit to the nonpartisan policy, and then go out and do it. And, you know, there's no amount of staff in the world that can make the League of Women Voters of Santa Barbara, or Dearborn, Michigan, or uh, Tacoma, or, or um, rural Georgia do it if they don't decide to do it. And I'm very proud to say they are deciding to do it. Uh, the South is a particularly good example of it. Uh, in terms of broader funding, um, people were content to be just, you know, give their time and not their money. Uh, that's another way the organization as a whole is changing that at, at the national level, uh, at the, the states which have staff, uh, some of the big city leagues, metropolitan leagues, which, which have a very small number of staff, we are moving more and more towards people do not any longer want to be treasurer or you know roster manager or whatever it is. And so force of circumstances is moving the organization as a whole to find ways to professionalize some of that administrative work. And, and we're doing experimentation now with a number of the states on programs. You just can't, you know, th there's a real problem with making a unilateral definition. We're going to use this new system to administer the organization. Well, you know what happens. It's a disaster. So you have to, we have, uh, we are experimenting with uh, different models. Of, of administrative systems, software systems, that will enable state and local leagues to do less administrative work and more um, education and advocacy. And that's, we're in the process. Did you want to? No. 
I remember being at the convention. After you, then we got somebody up front here. Go ahead. We can hear you. Oh. We can hear you. Then, then pass the mic on down. I remember being at the League U.S. convention in the two, uh, 2000s that when you were uh, voted in as, for the second time, and it was contested, which was unusual, and I was not able to be clear on what the difficulties were. Did that also represent some of the difficulties of having you as a black person uh, being voted in? It's a complicated answer. Um, one of the things, I never mention race um, at all. I always see myself as a league member, and that's how I present. Um, so there were lots of conversations taking place, some factual, some non. Um, one of the things that uh, I address in the book is uh, it's a chapter called A Matter of Principle. So I chose to run again as a matter of principle. And um, there were a number of comments made, which was interesting to me because like I said, I never mentioned race. I don't have to. <laughs> um, so I, I can't answer that for the people who were there. I can only say that it was not an issue for me. Um, realistically, in the world that we live in, it may have been. Okay, we have somebody down here. We need a microphone. Okay, thanks. Hi. Um, when you talk about diversity, inclusion, and equity, uh, I have a question for you around the equity piece. So the diversity piece I understand is having, and in this case we're mostly talking about race and ethnicity, um, having diverse race and ethnicity represented in the league. And in the case of inclusion, we're talking about the fact of having their voices heard and valued. But uh, when you talk about equity, I'm wondering how you're defining equity in this case. And is it that um, people of different race and ethnicities have access to the league? Or is it more around the comment you made that it is uh, just becomes part of the you know, the system of the league and it's no longer an identified project? Well, uh, equity, it's, it's very complicated and I wish we had that little graphic that we always show where you have three little boys looking over a fence that, yeah. okay. Well, equity in, in the, uh, looking at the organization would be um, economic equity. Uh, people who join us are not all affluent, and so what kind of changes does the organization need to make in terms of dues structure? Uh, how much does it, how much is it? Um, do we go to a different dues structure that is equal across the entire organization uh, and allow people to pay five dollars 12 times, or whatever. There's, there's, there's an equity would be, certainly recognizing that if you're going to be really inclusive and diversive, um, diverse, you have to uh, offer people who don't have the same socioeconomic background as you do an opportunity to join and participate um, equally. That's, and, and we're in the process now, one of the biggest single arguments within the league is uh, altering the due structure uh, you know, some leagues are $85 and some leagues are $40. And, you know, it, 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 how do we create an organization that makes it easy for people, no matter who they are, to join us? That's part of the equity thing. I'd like to introduce a question, if there isn't one from the floor right now, about uh, how the league finds itself in this moment now where we have a, a, we've had multiple women, in at least in the Democratic Party, running for president. We have this case against Harvey Weinstein and the Me Too movement. Women are finding their voices and demanding more. How has the League helped to serve that purpose over its 100 years, and how can it 
what can it do now at this moment for the next 100 years to help ensure that women continue to, our voices continue to be heard, this problem of, of misogyny and, and systematic you know, issues around gender are addressed? Again, I can say that's a complex question. Uh, the League has always focused on issues and good governance and policy, um, and those are the areas where we focus. Over the 100 years, we have always had specific areas where we focus. Um, the Instances that you mentioned are just new areas that fall into the already approved issues that the league is focusing on. Um, I, the reason I'm, I'm hesitant is because I never actually uh, talk about candidates or uh, what's going on. I talk about processes and what makes democracy work and what the Constitution says, and I, that's my lane, so that's where I stay. Um, but the fact that women's voices now are louder uh, than they have been in the last couple of decades doesn't mean they weren't that loud in the 60s and 70s. They were that loud in the 20s. And so this is not new to the League. This is just a point in time where the League provides the foundation to make movement in those areas. Well, well, I'd add to that, um, no matter who you were, you joined the League and, and you did learn process. Boy, did you learn process. Uh, but you learned how, how government worked uh, at its most basic, uh, local, state, and national government, which is something that lots of people never knew and still don't know. So you, you had, a, you had a, a leg up there, but, but also within the organization you learned how to run a meeting, how to organize and run a committee, how to run a campaign. Uh, so whether you were organizing a voter registration drive or a candidate's forum or a, a protest to your city council, you learned how to organize and how to lead. And there, up until very recently, there were very few organizations that gave you that ability in the sphere of government. And so it's always been there. We, we had, for decades, during, uh, high school program, Running to Win, where we taught, we did programs with high school girls how to run for office, how to run for student office. Uh, we ramped up that now. We offer um, forums, uh, how to run for office to women. We don't ask what your party affiliation is. We encourage women to run for office, and we offer them, uh, partnering with allies, to teach how do you do this. You just don't walk out and do it. You just have, you have to learn, what do I need to do in order to run a viable campaign? We, we encourage women trying to how to apply for and get appointed to and work on commissions, which is very often the stepping stone to running for office. Um, and, and that is a thing that a real upsurge uh, in interest in people in the League, coming to the League to do what we always did, which is train you in leadership in order to speak to government. Because speaking to government is different than speaking in other arenas, and that is really what we have always done and what we need to do more of. I want to talk about this. Uh, oh, it's not up there anymore. Is the diversity policy up there? Could you put oh, it? It was. Yeah, I can put it. Okay. Could could we put that back up, please? Um, the national board adopted this a year and a half ago, I guess it was, and we are asked all state and local leagues to adopt it, at least the first paragraph. And I, I will say that as part of a bylaws change this year, we want to elevate that first paragraph up right with our nonpartisan policy to make that, you know, so this is something that the first three articles of the national bylaws, everybody has to to abide by, to put there. But we encourage all of our local organizations, and I hope if you haven't yet done it, you will, at least adopt that first paragraph as your diversity, equity, and inclusion policy right with your nonpartisan policy, because that makes a very clear statement. 
isn't, uh, well, we're nonpartisan, in, and then, you know, we go out and we'll try to be diverse, equity, equitable, and inclusive if we have the time. No, <clears throat> we, we bring this DEI lens just as we bring our non-policy lens to every single thing that the National League does, whether the staff we hire, the contractors we work with, the vendors, um, you know, what kind of hotels we go to, uh, and state leagues are doing the same thing. Uh, you know, in, in all aspects, we are nonpartisan and we are diverse, equitable, and inclusive. And it, it has to be, we use that lens to look at our action policies. Uh, if we're going to be talking about environmental justice, uh, how, what, what, how does the, that lens apply? Uh, no matter what it is. And so this is, this is a, an ongoing commitment. And I certainly hope that the Santa Barbara League, if you haven't already done it, the board gets that first paragraph very soon. I just want to say that I am encouraged by the kinds of questions that you're asking, because this celebration, the 100th anniversary, provides such a unique opportunity for us to shape our future. And so as you are challenging some of the, the systems that are going on, as you are looking toward what your league can do differently, have those conversations. The league is a grassroots membership organization, and there is no one answer for everybody. Leagues represent the communities in which they thrive. And so there are multiple ways for success. There are multiple ways uh, for leagues to look. And I, I think back to the day of action on February 14th, there were how many, 300 and 30? Yeah, on that day, but, but then all the people who could, the leagues that couldn't do it on that day, <laughs> have been doing it for the last two weeks. Uh, a number, um, over, well over 400. And they, they were not all the same. They reflected the communities. I mean, again, that was encouraging. So one of the things that, that I want you to walk away with from this discussion and, and from my presentation is that we are hopeful that the league for the next 100 years is going to be the organization that we aspire to be. When I was president, I used to say, I, I was president at the turn of the century, and I always said I brought the league kicking and screaming into the 21st century because before all you had to have was the facts, and then you had to, we went into computers. Um, and hanging chads, I was saying to Chris, if I hear that one more time, I am going to scream because I was president during the 2000 election. But we need, what we need to do is use this opportunity to be the league that we want to be. And this is the opportunity to do. The fact that you're here today means that you are interested and that you have some ideas about how this should move forward. I used to always say, in 2000, I said, if we cannot reinvent ourselves to remain relevant, then at the 100th anniversary, let's just lift our glasses, pat ourselves on the back, and close our doors. We're not ready to do that. Look at the environment that we're in. We're needed now more than ever. And we need to accept that responsibility. We have all the tools to make this democracy work. And it, it's our obligation to do so. So that's what our charge is to you, is to make sure that, that we keep moving. We don't need to sh shut our doors at 100 years.